Hi everyone, welcome back. We're now in our second lecture for Chapter 2, Chemistry. Um, today we're going to be looking at how atoms, remember we introduced atoms previously, we're going to be looking at how those atoms and why those atoms interact with each other. And usually atoms will interact with other atoms, not always, but we're going to see what those driving forces are and then we're also going to look at the different ways that, intera uh, that those interactions can take place. So let's begin with our not really attendance questions. And as always, go ahead and pause the video and try to answer these on your own before listening. So which of the following is not made of matter? Your computer, your body, a glass of water, the air in your room, more than one of the above, or none of the above? And second, in the planetary model of the atom, it shows electrons in rings around the nucleus of the atom. What are those rings called? Now, before I go over the answers, I do want to quickly point out something, uh, since we do have our first exam not too terribly far away. Um, normally, in a class, uh, if your instructor has a question that looks something like you see here, uh, a multiple choice question, and you see either more than one of the above or none of the above, that's automatically a key of, hey, it's got to be this. Well, if you've never had me before, uh, you may not know, but I put something like that on almost every question that I ask. So if you read one of my multiple choice questions and you see more than one of the above as one of the answers, don't automatically assume that it is more than one of the above. I put that on there because I want to see, do you really know the answers? Or are you trying to think outside and just think, oh, well, it's got to be this because this is always the answer. Not in my class. Uh, sometimes it is, but it's not always. So, which of the following is not made of matter? Your computer, your body, a glass of water, the air in your room, more than one of the above, or none of the above? Well, what was matter? Remember, matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. So your computer takes up space and has mass. So that's off the table. Your body takes up space and has mass. That's knocked out. A glass of water. Both the glass and the water take up space and have mass. So, nope, that's not it. The air in your room, this one's the tricky one. The air in your room, it takes up space. You don't see it, but it's taking up space. And it has mass. Not a lot, but it has mass. So, the answer is none of the above. These are all made of matter. The planetary model of the atom shows electrons in rings around the nucleus of the atom. What are those rings called? We called them orbitals or shells. And today we're going to be looking at those later on in this lecture. So let's start talking about atoms interacting with each other in the various ways that they can. Let's start out with some terminology. First, we're going to look at the molecule and compound. Now, Molecules and compounds are very similar, and we've probably all heard these words. And a lot of times people will use them interchangeably, and that's not always correct. So what is the difference between a molecule and a compound? A molecule is two or more atoms joined together. And those atoms could be the same element or different elements. It could be uh, for example, two oxygens joined together. O2 is how we would write that. Two oxygens joined together. So that's two of the same element joined together. That's a molecule. This is called molecular oxygen. Carbon dioxide, written CO2. The C is carbon, and O2 tells us there are two oxygens, and they're all joined together. Well, we have two of the same and a different element joined together. So again, still a molecule. Water, H2O, 
two hydrogens and an oxygen all joined together. Again, two of the same and a different element joined together, it's still a molecule. Any time we have two or more atoms joined together, it is a molecule. Now let's look at compounds. Compounds are also two or more atoms joined together. But in compounds, it is always going to be composed of different elements. For example, NH4, ammonia. H2O, water. Well, over here we said H2O is a molecule. But over here we say it's a compound. So which is it? It's both. All compounds are molecules. But all molecules are not necessarily compounds. I'll say that again. All compounds are molecules. But all molecules are not necessarily compounds. So NH4 and H2O, they are compounds and they are molecules. CO2 is a compound and a molecule. Oxygen, molecular oxygen, O2, it's a molecule, but it is not a compound. It's a molecule because it is two or more of the same or different element joined together, in this case, two of the same element. But it is not a compound because in a compound, the two are always different. Now, we can have more than one of the same. So, for example, in H4, we have four hydrogens, but we also have a nitrogen. So there's always multiple elements in the compound. If we just had two H's joined together, that would be a molecule, but not a compound. All right, now let's look at something called a mixture. And we're going to look at some examples of mixtures, and then we will come back and talk about the different types of mixtures. Uh, so mixtures are two or more components physically intermixed. Two or more components physically intermixed. Now, there are no chemical bonds holding these mixtures together but they are two or more components physically intermixed. Now, let's look at the different types of mixtures. There's something called a solution, which we see here. There's something called a colloid, which we see here. And there's something called a suspension, which we see here. Now, we're going to talk about all three of these. Solution is what we're going to talk about the most this semester. So let's go ahead and look at colloids and suspensions on this page with solutions, but we will come back to solutions again later. So when we talk about things being mixed together in mixtures, we're going to talk about two words. We're going to talk about something called the solvent, and something called the solute. Solvent and solute. Now, solvent is what you have more of, and it's what dissolves the other part, the solute. The solvent does the dissolving, and it's almost always water. As a matter of fact, in our class, I think every example we give will be water. Now, the solute is the lesser portion. There's less of it, and it's what gets dissolved. The solvent, there's more of it, and it does the dissolving. The solute, there's less of it, and it gets dissolved. And here, in every case, there is solvent and there is solute. 
in the case of the solution, and again, we'll come back to it in a moment, a good example would be something like salt water. In salt water, or I think, let me look to see, this picture is on page 50 of your textbook. This is copper sulfate solution. So we have water with copper sulfate dissolved in it. Now, when we talk about uh, the, the other two, we can see that if we try to look through them, we really can't. In the solution, we can. We can see through it. It's not completely clear, but we can see through it. In the other two, we cannot. So that's going to be a key when we're trying to figure out the difference in solutions and colloids and suspensions. So in a colloid, the solute is pretty big compared to what it was in the solution. Now, when I say big, I mean the size of the solute particles. In solution, the solute particles are very tiny. But in colloid, the solution the, the solute particles are a little larger. In a suspension, the solute particles are really large. That's what it's trying to show you down here in this drawing. The blue dots versus the yellow dots versus the red circles. So we can see as we go to the right from solution to colloid to suspension, the solute particles are getting bigger. Now, in solution, the solute particles, we could let this sit for a really long time, and the solute particles will never settle out. They will stay intermixed. And when we look through it, like I said, it's kind of clear. We say that the solute particles do not scatter light. They do not scatter light. When we look at the colloid, we just said that the solute particles are a little bit bigger. If we let this sit for a long time, now this is milk. This is what we have as an example here. This is milk. If we let it sit, those solute particles are going to stay intermixed. They are not going to settle out. But they do scatter light. In a colloid, the particles are a little bit bigger than they were in the solution. The solute particles are bigger than they were in the solution, but they remain intermixed. They do not settle out, and they do scatter light. Next, suspension. In a suspension, this is blood. So, blood. The red blood cells, called erythrocytes, that's what we see right here, they are suspended. They are very large. So the solute, the erythrocytes, are very large. So large that if we let this sit, they settle out. And that's what we see right here. They sink to the bottom, so they settle out. And also, like we saw in the colloid, it does scatter light. Now, the interesting thing about blood, they use blood as an example of a suspension, but it is actually all three. Blood is a suspension, it is a colloid, and it is a solution. We have salt water in the blood. We have sodium chloride mixed with water. We also have proteins, so the plasma has a lot of stuff in it, and the plasma serves as both a solution and a colloid, and the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, make it a suspension. So it's possible for something to be more than one. 
Now, I said we would come back to solutions, so let's look at a little bit uh, deeper at solutions. Solutions, we say, are homogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous mixtures. Homo means same. So homogeneous mixtures means they are the same throughout. It doesn't matter which portion we look at. Let's go back to our picture here. If we look right up here, if we look over here, if we look down here, it's all the same. It doesn't matter which portion we look at. It's the same throughout. So it is homogeneous. The solvent versus the solute, we've already spoken about. The solvent is the greater portion that does the dissolving. Usually it's water. The solute, there's less of it. It is what is being dissolved. It could be anything. It could be something like sugar. It could be salt. It could be sodium. It could be any number of things. But it is what is dissolved in the solvent. And when we talk about solutions, we're going to talk about it in terms of concentration. For example, you may hear something called a 5% sodium solution. Now, when we talk about percent, we are talking about the percent of solute. So if you have a 5% sodium solution, that means 5% of that solution is sodium. The other 95% is water. If you have a 20% sucrose solution, that means 20% of that solution is sucrose, table sugar. But the other 80% is water. Sometimes you will hear concentration referred to in terms of milligrams per deciliter. Milligrams per deciliter. Uh, if you know anyone who's diabetic or if you are diabetic and you've ever taken a blood glucose reading, a blood sugar reading, that is actually expressed in terms of milligrams per deciliter. How much glucose in milligrams per deciliter of blood. And molarity, or moles per liter. Uh, this is a chemistry term that I am not going to expect you all to know. Just know that you may see something expressed in molarity. For example, in chemistry class, you may talk about uh, something like hydrochloric acid in terms of molarity. We will not. In this class, we are going to use percent of solute. But... Keep in mind, in, in medical fields, you will often also use milligrams per deciliter. This portion will come back in Chapter 3. We are going to talk about solutions in Chapter 3, and we are going to talk about the percent of solute when we talk about solutions. So, I've covered the outline in a little bit different order. Uh, when I talked about it here. So we have already talked about the colloids, the suspensions. Um, I do want to talk about the heterogeneous, uh, where we see that there in colloids, which are sometimes called emulsions. This was our milk, is what we used as an example. It is a heterogeneous mixture. That means it is not the same throughout. Now, if you take a glass of milk and you look at the top of it or you look at the middle of it or you look at the bottom of it, you think, well, this is the same throughout. But there's two things to keep in mind. One, that milk had been put through a process called homogenization. Homogenized milk. You've probably heard that term. That means they actually did something so that it would remain homogeneous. If they had not done that, milk is actually heterogeneous. If you let milk that has not been homogenized, if you just let milk sit there, for example, if you live on a farm, if you've ever milked a cow and you let that milk sit, the cream does what? The cream 
rises to the top, and the other portions of the milk will sink to the bottom. So over time, the milk itself separates. Different portions of it will be made of different substances. So milk, or colloids in general, are heterogeneous. Suspensions. Suspensions are also heterogeneous. For example, we just used blood as an example. If you take a drop of blood and put it under a microscope, it is not even throughout. In one section, you may see a whole lot of erythrocytes. Over here, you may see some platelets. Over here, you'll see just plasma. Over here, you'll see white blood cells or leukocytes. It's not exactly the same throughout. So that's heterogeneous. Now moving on, let's compare mixtures that we just talked about to compounds that we talked about earlier. In mixtures, there is no chemical bonding between the solute and the solvent. It can be separated by physical means. We can strain it. We can filter it. And in mixtures, they could be heterogeneous. They could be homogeneous. But compounds, compounds are chemically bound to each other. There are chemical bonds between the different components. And those components can only be separated by doing something to break those bonds. We'll talk about chemical bonds here in just a few moments. But compounds are always homogeneous, always the same throughout. So here's our uh, periodic table of the elements again. I suggest going ahead and either printing this out or having a copy of this available because we're going to refer to it quite a bit. Now we're going to talk about why chemicals, uh, chemical bonding occurs. Why do atoms form bonds with other atoms? Or, in some cases, why do atoms not bond with other atoms? And it's going to come down to something called electronegativity. Now, let's go back and look at our periodic table here. Think back to something we said near the end of the last lecture and these different numbers down the side and across the top. The numbers across the top, if we just look at the purple, remember we ignore the yellow and the gray. If we just look at the purple, look at those Roman numerals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What did we say those Roman numerals meant? Those were the number of electrons in the outermost shell. Now, I don't remember if I told you the name of that shell in the last lecture, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you now. The outermost shell is called the valence shell. The valence shell. And the electrons in the valence shell are called valence electrons. So, in this first column, how many valence electrons do we have? One. The second column, we have two valence electrons. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons. Except for helium. Helium kind of doesn't really belong in any of these columns. It has two valence electrons. So sometimes you'll see it put over here. Sometimes you'll see it floating around on its own. Sometimes you'll see it over here all the way on the right. But everything from neon downward has eight valence electrons. Now, if we look at these numbers, these are how many shells there are. How many shells there are, how many valence electrons there are. That's what the two sets of numbers mean. Now, think back to what we said about the different shells. The first shell can hold how many electrons total? Two. 
and the second shell and every shell after that can hold how many electrons total? Eight. So, valence shells, in the case of helium and hydrogen, the valence shell can hold up to two electrons. Every other element, the valence shell can hold eight electrons. So as we go to the right, what's happening to the valence shell? It's filling up. If we looked at, let's just look at this uh, second row here. Lithium has one valence electron. Beryllium has two. Boron has three. Carbon has four. Nitrogen has five. Oxygen has six. Fluorine has seven. Neon has eight. So as we go to the right on the periodic table, we are adding valence electrons. The valence shell is filling up. Now, as we go down the periodic table, we are just adding more shells. So let's talk about something called electronegativity that we just saw. Electronegativity is a term that means how hard does an atom pull on electrons? Electronegativity, how hard does an atom pull on electrons? Or sometimes you'll also see it written or uh, said, how strongly does an atom pull electrons towards itself? How strongly does an atom pull electrons towards itself? So that's electronegativity. Now, if we look at the periodic table, the further to the right we go, and the higher up we go, the greater the electronegativity. The further to the right and the higher up, the greater the electronegativity. So these uh, uh, atoms up here in the top right, these elements, are the most electronegative. Up in the top right, that is the most electronegative. So, why do atoms bond with other atoms? Because if they are not full in their valence shell, then they're not satisfied, they're not happy. Elements that do not have full valence shells will bond with other atoms in an attempt to fill up their valence shells. I'll say that again. Elements that do not have full valence shells will bond with other atoms to fill up their valence shells. So. These guys over here, all the way in the right, how many valence electrons do they have? They have eight, or two in the case of helium, but they have eight valence electrons. Their valence shell is full. So this column eight does not bond with other atoms. There's no need for it to. Its valence shell is already full. But all of the other atoms, all of the other elements, will form chemical bonds in an attempt to fill up their valence shell. So the reason that atoms bond is an attempt to fill up their valence shell. And electronegativity is going to play a big role in how they bond. So what we're going to do now is go to our whiteboard and we're going to draw different types of chemical bonds. Now before I switch over to the whiteboard, what I would like you all to do is find sodium on your periodic table. 
Sodium is Na, and I will tell you it is atomic number 11. Sodium is Na, atomic number 11. So go ahead and draw that before I bring the whiteboard up. I'm going to let you pause it here so that you can draw sodium. And hopefully you got something that at least sort of resembles this. This is not an art class. I am by no means an artist. We will do a lot of drawing, but I don't claim to draw well. So hopefully you got something that looks like this for your sodium atom. Remember, I draw the atomic symbol in the middle to represent the nucleus. Sodium, atomic number 11. So how many protons does this Na represent? Well, the atomic number 11 is the number of protons. So there are 11 protons there. And in its natural state, and today we're going to see what I mean by natural state versus what happens when something isn't in its natural state. So in its natural state, as we have drawn here, how many electrons does sodium have? Well. The number of electrons is always equal to the number of protons in its natural state. So there's our sodium atom with 11 protons here in the nucleus and 11 electrons orbiting it. Two in the first shell, that's all that it can hold. Since we have more than two, we have to add another shell. It can hold up to eight. Well, two and then eight is 10. We still need another shell for that 11th, and that's what we have right here. So now, let's, let's do another drawing example. Uh, before continuing, pause the video and draw a chlorine atom. Chlorine is atomic symbol Cl, atomic number 17. So go ahead and draw that. And let's see if you got that. There's our chlorine atom. Chlorine with atomic, uh, atomic number 17. So how many protons does it have? 17, and that's what that Cl represents. In its natural state, how many electrons does it have? The same as protons. 17. 2 in the first shell, 8 in the second shell, 7 left over, so they go in a third shell. Hopefully everyone was able to draw sodium and everyone was able to draw chlorine based on everything that we learned in the previous lecture. So now let's talk about bonding. Here we have our sodium on the left that we just drew and our chlorine on the right that we just drew. And if we look, how many valence electrons does sodium have? It has 11 electrons, but how many valence electrons does it have? It has one. So how many more electrons does sodium need to have a full valence shell? It needs seven more electrons in order to fill that shell up. What about chlorine? How many valence electrons does it have? It has seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many more electrons does it need to have a full valence shell? It only needs one more. So, chlorine needs one. Sodium needs seven. Now, if we also go back and look at our periodic table, hopefully you have that handy. Where is sodium on the periodic table? It is all the way on the left. It's in the first row. Where is chlorine? It's almost as far to the right as you can get. So, which one is more electronegative? Chlorine. Remember, the further to the right and the higher up you go, the greater the electronegativity. So, if chlorine is more electronegative, which one of these atoms is pulling on electrons harder? Chlorine is, because it's more electronegative. So, chlorine is pulling all of his electrons towards himself. And sodium is pulling all of his electrons towards himself. But if they get close enough, which is kind of what we've drawn here, if they get close enough, 
not only is chlorine pulling on his electrons, he's pulling on these over here also. And not only is sodium pulling on his electrons, he's pulling on chlorines also. But who's pulling harder? Chlorine is. So in addition to pulling on his electrons, he's pulling on sodium's electrons too. And he's pulling harder on this electron than sodium is. So what actually is going to happen is this electron here is going to be pulled out of its shell and taken by chlorine. Chlorine took an electron from sodium. So let's look at the two things that happen. How many valence electrons does chlorine have now? He has eight, so he is satisfied. That's exactly what chlorine wants. He's now got a full valence shell. But how many total electrons does chlorine have now? 18. So let's change this to 18. Over here at sodium, how many electrons does he have in his valence shell? Well, it seems like the answer would be zero, but that's not the case. What actually happens is when the valence shell doesn't have any electrons in it, it vanishes, and the next shell in becomes the valence shell. So how many valence electrons does sodium have? He has eight, and that's exactly what he wants. Remember, everyone wants their valence shell to be full. Sodium's valence shell is full. Chlorine's valence shell is full. But how many total electrons does sodium have? He has 10. So before we go any further, let's look to see sodium has 11 protons, positives, 10 electrons, negative. What does that mean? There's more positives than negatives. So instead of calling this a sodium atom, it's actually called a sodium ion. An ion is an atom with a charge. An ion I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> I can't remember exactly how I said that. An atom with a charge is called an ion. I think I said that. An atom with a charge is called an ion. So sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. But a sodium ion has 11 protons and 10 electrons. 11 positives, 10 negatives. So what's there more of? There's more positives. So instead of just writing Na for sodium, we write Na plus. Na with a little positive sign up in the top right. That tells us this sodium is an ion with a positive charge. This is the sodium ion. Now if we look over here at chlorine, chlorine is an atom with 17 protons and 17 electrons. But now we have 17 protons and 18 electrons. 17 positives, 18 negatives. So we don't just write Cl because Cl is chlorine. We actually call this chloride or the chloride ion, and we write it Cl with a minus up in the top right. So this is also an ion. The sodium ion and the chloride ion. Now sometimes more than one electron is taken. So if we have a positive two or a negative two. Well, that just tells you how many electrons were taken or how many electrons were gained. <laughs>
Now, let's go back and be a little bit more specific with our naming. Ion is an atom with a charge. But this sodium is an ion with a positive charge, and this chloride is an ion with a negative charge. So let's be more specific. Does ion mean positive or does ion mean negative? Well, ion just means charged. So an ion with a positive charge is called a cation. An ion with a negative charge is called an anion. So how do you keep this straight? How do you remember if a cation is positive or negative? Is an anion positive or negative? Well, in cation, there's your positive sign. Over here, anion is a negative ion. So cations are positive, anions are negative. And more importantly, let's see what this whole thing actually means. Chlorine was close enough to sodium to take an electron. And then we ended up with chloride and the sodium ion. An anion and a cation are near each other. We know they're near because chlorine was near enough to become chloride by taking an electron. So if we have a negative ion and a positive ion close to each other, What's going to happen? What happens when you have a positive end of a magnet and a negative end of a magnet stuck together or close together? They stick. So instead of having Na plus and Cl minus, they're going to stick together and we're going to get NaCl. Now, we don't write the positive, but there is a positive there and a negative there. I'm going to erase those because we don't write those when we have these joined together. So this is a bond that has formed. When a cation and an anion stick together, we get something called an ionic bond. Ionic bonds come about when one atom takes an electron from another atom and the resulting ions stick together. One atom takes an electron from another atom and the resulting ions stick together. And the reason they're sticking together is because opposite charges attract. And we no longer have Na and Cl, we have NaCl, sodium chloride, which is table salt. You probably had some sodium chloride this morning with your breakfast. Okay, so that is ionic bonding. Now, if we looked back at our periodic table, things over on the left in those first two columns tend to behave the way sodium just did. Things in column number seven tend to behave the way chlorine just did. So we will often see things in column one or column two form ionic bonds with things in column seven. Let's look at our next type of bond. Here I've drawn carbon. Carbon is atomic number six. Carbon has four valence electrons, which I've drawn here. So how many valence electrons does carbon need to have a full valence shell? He needs four more to achieve eight. Now, four is a weird number as far as how many valence electrons we have because He's unlikely to lose four electrons. He's going to hold on to those pretty strongly, but not strong enough that he will take electrons from anyone else. So since he's not going to give away electrons and since he's not going to take electrons, carbon doesn't really form ionic bonds like we just saw with sodium and chlorine. 
instead, we're going to have a different type of bond. We're going to have something called a covalent bond. Let's look to see how covalent bonds work. Over here, I've also drawn hydrogen. Hydrogen, remember, he only needs two electrons in his valent shell to be full, since he only has that one shell. So if chlorine, I'm sorry, if carbon and hydrogen get close enough together, then what actually happens is instead of taking or giving away electrons, they bump their valence shells together. And when their valence shells bump together, it actually joins, and instead of giving away or taking electrons, they are now sharing a pair of electrons. These electrons, two of them, are now held by hydrogen and by carbon, and they're held equally by both. We are sharing a pair of electrons. Now, this is the way that I typically draw it. In books, you will see this kind of shown this way. An H and a C with a line between them. That line represents two shared electrons. What, what good did that do? Let's look at hydrogen. If they are now sharing ownership of those electrons, how many electrons does hydrogen have? He has two. He has the one that he brought and the one that carbon brought. So hydrogen has a full valence shell. He's very happy. Carbon can do this with up to four atoms. So let's look at what happens if there are four hydrogens around. Every one of those hydrogens now has two electrons. Every one of those hydrogens is happy. Carbon now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many does he need? Eight. So hydrogen is happy. And again, we might see this written this way. You'll actually see this quite a bit in your textbook. And each one of these lines, again, represents one pair of electrons. So this is called a covalent bond. In a covalent bond, no one gives away electrons, no one takes electrons, they are shared. Now, we're going to come back to this in just a moment. So keep that page that you drew this on handy. So now we're looking at oxygen. That is an O in the middle, not a shell. So this is oxygen. Oxygen is atomic number eight. And it has two electrons in the first shell and six electrons in the valence shell. So he just needs two more electrons to, be, have, or to, to have a full valence shell. Now, oxygen is pretty far to the right, and it's very high up to the top, so it's going to pull on electrons pretty hard. It's very electronegative. Not hard enough to take electrons, but he's still going to pull on them pretty hard. So, again, remember hydrogen, he has one valence electron, but he only needs one more. So let's draw exactly what we just drew with carbon and hydrogen. If hydrogen gets close enough, then their shells will overlap and we will get some covalent bonding. They are sharing electrons. No one took anything, no one gave away anything. But if we look at where oxygen is on the periodic table, it's very far to the right, it's very high up, so it is very electronegative. Hydrogen is as far to the left as you can get, so he is very not electronegative. They are sharing electrons. 
But unlike carbon and hydrogen, who shared electrons equally, in this case, oxygen and hydrogen are sharing electrons unequally. Oxygen is pulling on those electrons much harder than hydrogen is. So those electrons are in more possession by oxygen and less by hydrogen. So even though oxygen did not take any electrons, he did not become negative, he is a little bit more negative than he was before. So the symbol for that is the lowercase Greek letter delta, which looks like what I just drew there. So this means oxygen is a little bit negative. He's not fully negative, but he's a little bit negative. And since the hydrogens are not in as strong of a possession of the electrons as they were before, this end is a little bit positive. Now what we've drawn here is a water molecule. Two H's and an O, H2O. And this is a covalent bond. They are sharing electrons. But this covalent bond and the other covalent bond that we drew are not the same. Here, they are sharing unequally, so we call it a polar covalent bond. If we look at our other with carbon and hydrogen, they're sharing and they're sharing equally, so this is a non-polar. So now we see the word polar for the first time this semester. We are going to see polar a lot. Now, what polar means is one area of something has one set of properties, while another area of the same thing has a different set of properties. In this case, we're talking about this type of bond, the resulting molecule. One area is slightly positive, the other area is slightly negative. Now, polar doesn't always mean charges. It just means this area up here is a little bit different than this area over here. They have different properties. So there's, now we've covered ionic bonds, polar covalent bonds, and nonpolar covalent bonds. Let's go a little bit further. Now we're going to back out and we're still going to look at that water molecule. Here's our water molecule backed off, and this is the way books typically draw it. I always say it kind of looks a little bit like Mickey Mouse. What we have there, this is on page 49 of your textbook. This is our oxygen, the one right in the middle that's like Mickey's face, and the two hydrogens that are his ears. And water always has a slightly negative oxygen side and a slightly positive hydrogen side. And we don't really ever have just a single water molecule. We have lots of water molecules. So that's what I've drawn here. And since they're always in that same orientation with oxygen being slightly negative and the hydrogens being slightly positive, that's going to set up our next type of bond. Now up to this point, we had bonds forming between two or more atoms resulting in a molecule. So remember this is water, which we just drew. There is a nonpolar covalent, I'm sorry, a polar covalent bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Over here there's a polar covalent bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And the same thing on all of these water molecules. This next type of bond is actually between different molecules or sometimes it's between different regions of a very large molecule. So this negative that we see right here and this positive that we see right here are attracted to each other. And there will be a slight bond formed between them. Again, there's a positive down here and a negative up here a negative here and a positive there, a positive here and a negative there. These bonds 
are similar to what we saw with ionic bonds. It's an attraction between the negative and the positive. But in this case, it's the negative of one molecule and the positive of a different molecule. These are called hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds occur between the negative region of one molecule and the positive region of a different molecule or between different regions of a large molecule. And hydrogen bonds, they are very, very weak. They are very short-lived. This bond that we drew only lasts for a moment and then it breaks. It may reform again and then break. Here it will last for a moment and then break. So they don't last very long and they're very, very weak. But typically when there are hydrogen bonds forming, there are lots of hydrogen bonds forming and collectively they are very, very strong. Hydrogen bonds actually hold your DNA together. So collectively, they are very strong. Now, hydrogen bonds, the only reason that they are able to form is because of polar covalent bonds that formed first. These polar covalent bonds that make one water molecule result in these positive and negative regions, the polarity of the water molecule itself. And then that sets up a situation that allows for hydrogen bonds. Now there is one more type of bond that I'm going to mention here. It won't really get a lot of attention this semester. We won't talk about it much, but I want to bring it up since your book does mention it. And that is something called van der Waals forces. And van der Waals forces are very similar to the hydrogen bonds we just drew. So here I've just drawn a generic atom. There is no element with an atomic symbol A. Uh, this is just representing atom and another atom. And I'm not even drawing valent shells or anything like that. I'm just saying this is a valent shell. Maybe it's the first one. Maybe it's the third one. It doesn't matter. This is just the valent shell. This is the valent shell. And there are some electrons in it. I'm not even going to draw the electrons. We're just drawing an atom. We're looking at its valent shell. Over here we have an atom and we're looking at its valent shell. And the electrons actually move around. They don't stay in one place. They uh, kind of hover. Remember when we looked at the different ways to draw atoms, one of them we saw that cloud of electrons. Those, those electrons are moving around, they're vibrating and moving all over. And sometimes the electrons are all over in one area of an atom. And even though that atom does not have a charge, this region of the atom is more negative and this region of the atom is more positive. Same thing over here. This atom Sometimes the electrons will kind of gather over in this region here, causing this side to be more negative and this side to be more positive. Well, if this happens in such a way that the electrons move for a moment and we have a positive region here and a negative region here, well, now they're going to stick. Kind of like a combination of a hydrogen bond or uh, an ionic bond. This is just because of the way that electrons move around and cause charges to develop within an atom. Uh, the best example of this, if you've ever seen uh, lizards that can walk up walls, well, their little toe pads have a lot of atoms in them that develop van der Waals forces, and that's what allows them to stick to the walls. Other than this one drawing here that I only did because your book brings it up, we will not talk about van der Waals forces. So let's go back to our slideshow. Here's kind of a summary 
of the different bonds that we've talked about. This is table 2.3, which is on page 46 of your textbook. And now let's talk about chemical reactions. We've, we've seen our bonds, the different types of bonds, and why they form. But in chemical reactions, bonds are being rearranged, or bonds are being formed, or bonds are being broken, or sometimes more than one of those things happening at once. And when we are talking about chemical reactions, we write them using things called chemical equations. And that's what we see down here. Sometimes they can be really, really straightforward and basic, like we see here. Sometimes they could be really large and very intimidating looking. But I'm going to try to break it down just to tell you the basics of what you need to know. When we have a chemical reaction, there's always going to be some things on the left, there's going to be an arrow, and some things on the right. Now, sometimes this arrow may be pointing the other direction. Sometimes the arrow may have a head on each end. Don't worry about that. We are just going to look at the way that we have it drawn here. The things that the arrow is pointing away from, so in this case, this H plus H, these are called the reactants. These are what we are starting with. The arrow shows the reaction itself, this represents the change that is occurring. And whatever the arrow is pointing towards, this is called the product or the products. These are what are produced during the reaction. Now we have the reactants, the arrow representing the reaction, and the products. In addition to that, we also have the relative proportions of each. So let's kind of look to see exactly what that means, because we also see some numbers here. If we just see a letter, that means one of them. So one hydrogen plus one hydrogen. If we see a number in front of it, that represents how many of that atom. So here we see 4H. So four individual hydrogens plus a carbon. Now let's look back up here at the hydrogens. This does not mean we just have two hydrogens. It just means every time this reaction occurs, we are taking a hydrogen and adding another hydrogen to it. This could be using two trillion hydrogens but it's always two hydrogens going through the reaction. That's what we mean by relative proportion. And during the reaction, what happens? Here we see H with a little bitty 2 at the lower right. When we see a 2 at the lower right, that means whatever is in front of it has a chemical bond holding it together. So what happened here? I have a hydrogen, another hydrogen, they go through a reaction, and the result is something called hydrogen gas. These are two hydrogens chemically joined together. That's what this chemical reaction has shown us. Down here, I have four individual hydrogen atoms plus a carbon. We go through a reaction, and now CH4. The four in the lower right tells me four hydrogens, all joined, and a carbon. Since there's nothing in between the C and the H, that means they are also joined together. The C, the four Hs, they all join together. This is what we drew just a few moments ago. And this is methane gas. So this is the reaction to make methane. Now, there are different types of reactions. There's something called synthesis reactions, which are also called anabolic reactions. In synthesis reactions, bonds are formed. So that's what we drew, or that's what we just saw in the previous slide. When the two hydrogens joined together to make H2, that was a synthesis reaction. We formed bonds between them. 
in decomposition reactions, which are also called catabolic reactions, we are taking bonds that are already there and breaking them. We're taking something bigger and breaking it into smaller parts. And then there's also something called exchange reactions. In exchange reactions, we are kind of mixing both of those together. It is synthesis reactions and decomposition reactions. So how do you keep all these straight? How do you know? Let's look first at the anabolic reactions. Well, bodybuilders will often take anabolic steroids. Anabolic, building, making bigger. We are taking a lot of small things, forming bonds between them to make something bigger. Bodybuilders will take anabolic steroids to build muscle. Catabolic breaks things down. If you've ever owned a cat, you know that cats can be destructive. They can break things. Well, catabolic reactions break bonds. Now, exchange reactions, this is kind of a stretch. I say to imagine you go grocery shopping. You're going to exchange your money for groceries. You walk into the store, you've got money in your pocket. The store owns a lot of groceries. When you go through the checkout, that will represent the exchange reaction. Your bond between you and your money is broken. The bond between the store and their groceries is broken. But a bond is formed between you and the groceries that you just bought, and a bond is formed between the grocery store and the money that you just gave them. You exchanged your money for groceries. Now I want to talk about a special type of exchange reaction. And, it, and this is called a redox reaction. It also stands for reduction and oxidation. Reduction and oxidation, or oxidation-reduction reactions. This is a type of decomposition. It is also a type of exchange reaction. But what does that have to do with these pictures that I've got here? Well, what I've got over here on the left is a lion. And I would like for you to think Leo says Gur. Down in the bottom, I've got, does anyone know what that is? That is an oil rig. And this is going to be a mnemonic to help us get through redox reactions. In redox reactions, we are going to be exchanging electrons. Electrons are going to be lost by one player and gained by another. So oxidation is when something loses electrons. Reduction is when something gains electrons. So oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. Now, this is the one that I learned. This is the one that stuck with me the most. But another that I've heard over here was Leo the Lion. Leo says grr. So, lose electrons, oxidation. Gain electrons, reduction. Whichever one sticks with you the most. Oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. Now, I'm going to go back to our whiteboard so that we can draw out an example of a redox reaction. 
Now, you do not need to know this equation that we're about to show. You will see it several times this semester. We're going to write out the equation for cellular respiration. This is how your body makes energy from the food that you eat. But again, you do not need to know this reaction. So, what I've got here is C6H12O6, which is glucose. That comes from the food that you eat. Plus oxygen. This is why we breathe. It's going to go through a reaction. And it's going to produce six CO2. This is why we breathe carbon dioxide out. And six water. In the process, it also produces energy. So this is a redox reaction. Now remember, we're going to be looking to figure out where the electrons go. We're going to look to see who gains electrons and who loses electrons. But the trouble here is we can't really easily see the electrons. Instead, in biology, now this won't always work in chemistry, in biology, we can actually substitute the word electron for hydrogen, because it's always going to be hydrogen that is gained or lost in redox reactions in biology. So, how do we know which one gained and which one lost? How do we know who was oxidized and how do we know who was reduced? Well, what we have to do is look to see on the left, what did we start with? And on the right, what did we end up with? And over here, if we look to see, we started with C6H12O6. Now, it's not proper, but let's ignore the numbers. I'm actually going to go through and just scribble through the numbers. So we're just going to look at the letters. Over here, we have CHO and O. Over here we have CO and HO. We're going to look to see, since we can't follow the electrons, we're going to follow the hydrogens. On the left, who starts with a hydrogen? Well, glucose. And over here, do we have any C's and O's without any H's attached to them? Yeah, it's right there, our carbon dioxide. So. If this CHO, if this glucose, lost hydrogen, what would it be? It would be CO. And that's what we have right here. We lost electrons. What do we call it when we lose electrons? Losing electrons is oxidation. So the glucose. was oxidized to carbon dioxide. The glucose lost H+, plus. it lost electrons. I'm sorry, it lost H, so it lost electrons. So it was oxidized in the process, and the result was carbon dioxide. The oxygen started out without any hydrogens attached to it. Do we have any oxygens on the other side with H's attached to them? We sure do, right there, water. So the oxygen gained electrons in the form of hydrogen. And what happens when something gains electrons? It is reduced. So oxygen was reduced to water. Here we just follow the H's. We always look on the left to see who gained H's and who lost H's in the process. The way we do that is we look over on the right to see where is the H, who has it after the reaction is done. 
the glucose lost hydrogen and we're left with carbon dioxide. It was oxidized. The oxygen gained hydrogen, it was reduced to produce water. Okay, so now we can see oxidation reduction reactions, we're losing or gaining electrons. And we're oxidizing one agent, we're reducing another agent. And since I can't see your faces, I can't see what questions you have, but I can tell you from experience, there is one question that comes up every semester when I talk about this. And that comes from this word right here, reduced. When we think about the word reduced, typically we think of somebody losing something. That seems to go exactly the opposite of what we just said. Gaining something is reduced. But the explanation for that is, what are we gaining? We're gaining electrons. And what can you tell me about electrons? They have negative charges. Electrons have negative charges. So if we gain negatives, then our charge is reduced. That's why gaining electrons is reduction. Losing electrons is oxidation. All right, so back to our lion and our oil rig, and that will be where we wrap up today. I know this was a big lecture compared to what we've had so far. I suggest watching at a time or two, maybe even watching some YouTube videos or some Khan Academy videos just to get some extra exposure to chemical reactions. Now, we've got two lectures left for chapter two, and once we get through those next two lectures, it will be time for our first lecture exam. All right, ask those questions as you have them, please. I'm, I'm here to answer those questions, and if I don't get the questions from you, I can only assume that you understand. All right, take care, and I will talk to you in the next lecture.